In the 1790s, the future of the city was bright, based on water. We had a port, second to none, made this the trading capital of the New World. A yellow fever epidemic nearly destroyed Philadelphia in 1793 and returned repeatedly throughout the decade. The memories of this epidemic inspired action, much of which was based on a belief, to be disproven a century later, that yellow fever was transmitted by foul, impure water. The conditions in the 1790s was third world. Uh, 20 foot homes, a privy, along with a well on the same property. It was a place to breed disease. We have a proof that there does exist in the mode by which the city is supplied by water a very abundant source of disease, independent of the noxious exhalations of the narrow and filthy alleys and lanes. It is true that the inhabitants of Philadelphia drink very little water. It is too bad to be drunk. Benjamin Henry Latrobe, 1797. To safeguard public health, Philadelphia's city councils resolved to create the nation's first municipal water supply. For design, they would turn to Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Benjamin Latrobe was America's first professional architect and engineer. He wanted to install a steam engine at the foot of Chestnut Street, where it meets the Schuylkill. And from there, the water would flow underground through a brick conduit to Center Square, where City Hall now stands. And at Center Square, he proposed a second steam engine that would raise the water into a couple of large cisterns or tanks. And from there, the water then would be distributed by gravity throughout the city through a system of about six miles of wooden white oak pipes bored out to about four to six inches. And it was quite a, a revolutionary concept. In January of 1801, a steam-powered pump house began supplying water to the city. Latrobe's pump house at Center Square was a technological marvel itself. The construction of this unique looking building in the Center Square, as it were, kind of um, revived Philadelphia's reputation as a progressive city. The Center Square pump house became a popular gathering space as Philadelphians marveled at the beautiful machine. In 1809, the city commissioned sculptor William Rush to create a fountain to complement the pump house. His sculpture, Water Nymph and Bittern, would be the nation's first piece of publicly funded artwork. If you look at the waterworks, it's a cylinder inserted into a cube and capped by a hemisphere. It's a restatement of the Roman pantheon, but it's a pantheon not to the gods, it's a pantheon to the modern gods of steam and fire. Almost immediately, there were problems. The steam engine was noisy, dangerous, constantly threatened to explode. And by 1810, the demands of the growing city had exceeded the capacity of the pump house. With Latrobe now in Washington designing the United States Capitol building, the watering committee turned to two of his apprentices, Frederick Graff and John Davis. They came up with what we now know of as the Fairmount Waterworks. Fairmount was actually a very high prominence in the city. It's where the art museum now stands. Fairmount had been the estate of William Penn. Frederick Graff looked around the banks of the Schuylkill at the summer houses that had been built by members of Philadelphia's elite. And he built a pumping facility, a pumping building that echoed the style of these houses, this wonderful sort of genteel neoclassical style. But soon after the Fairmount works were completed, the limitations of steam power again threatened to cripple the water supply. In 1819, the watering committee suggested another approach. They finally decided to get rid of the steam engines and to build a dam across the river and to use the, uh, the hydraulic power of the dam to pump the water into the city system. That was the largest dam in the world. 
when it was uh, finished in 1819. So you could come to Philadelphia and see within this scenic landscape two of the most advanced engineering structures in the world at that time. And this was a very, very powerful way of erasing the memory of yellow fever. On July 1st, 1822, the first water wheel began to turn. And by the end of the year, three were in operation. Within months, the public could glimpse Graft's waterworks in their completed state. The waterworks at Fairmount became the second most popular tourist destination in the United States in the 19th century after Niagara Falls. Philadelphia is most bountifully provided with fresh water, which is showered and jerked about and turned on and poured off everywhere. The waterworks are no less ornamental than useful, being tastefully laid out as a public garden and kept in the best and neatest order. The whole city, to the top stories of the houses, is supplied at a very trifling expense. Charles Dickens. So here we have the, the pressures of science, reason, engineering, technology in the modern world placed smack dab on top of the area that America's painters most enjoy painting. So it's this collision of technology and beauty which makes that one, one of the most fraught, fraught corners of, of the young republic. The internet is as nothing as compared to drinkable water. For thousands of years, human beings have suffered for the lack of drinkable water. And Philadelphia becomes the place where this is tackled, not on an individual level or on a family level, on a, on a farm unit level, but on a municipal level. Following Philadelphia's example, cities everywhere would now supply water to their citizens, a role that evolved over the centuries. In the 1800s, source water protection was the key. In the 1900s, it was the pride of treatment, and we were able to treat anything. At the turn of this century, we're looking at bringing infrastructure back. We're looking at something called green infrastructure, which is managing water in a more green, holistic way. For nearly a century, the Fairmount Waterworks supplied fresh water to the city. In the 1850s, the city set aside the green space around the waterworks to create a small park and garden called Fairmount Park. It would grow into the largest landscaped park in the nation. To this day, the ancient colonnades and porticos at the foot of the park provide a popular retreat for the people of Philadelphia.